been circulating the clip about how he he looked for little girls and there's little you know, little girls need the love of their father and they need to be hugged and they need certain things and if they don't get that they're going to look somewhere else and then so he was describing what he looked for and how he prayed on little girls is what he did in that sermon but i have when i heard that i immediately said that wasn't me but when i did tell um you know, one of the things I'm sure you read that was he told me the very first time, you can't tell anyone because it will ruin everything. This clip from CBS telling us about what has transpired at Gateway Church concerning the elders there. So let's dive right into that. 10 o'clock, Gateway Pastor James Morris and three church elders have announced that they are going to take a temporary leave of absence now. All of this amid those child sexual abuse claims against the church's founder and former pastor, Robert Morris. The church says elders Kevin Grove, Steve Doolin, and Galen Losh have all volunteered to take the temporary leave, and their attorneys uh, are the ones who apparently suggested all of this. All three were told worked on the board of elders from 2005 to 2007, and that's why Morris's accuser, Cindy Clemshire, said that she contacted Morris to confront him about the alleged abuse. The church says all three elders did not have all the facts at the time. Because Pastor James Morris is the son of the man accused, he has also taken a temporary leave of absence, saying, quote, Pastor James has volunteered to do so to demonstrate his commitment to truly independent and unbiased inquiry. And the church says that all four leaders will continue their work as staff members during their temporary leave from the board there you have it so that's the latest update from gateway church and that concerns the four elders who are now taking leave okay so uh let's uh, show the elders who are actually going away okay so you have Kevin Glove is one of the elders who is uh, living, and Gayland Lashaw, and Steve, I think Steve is up, Steve is, Steve Dillon. So these are the elders who are taking uh, leave. So Gateway, they have issued a statement to let uh, the congregation know as to what has transpired. So if we could show that. Okay, so this is the update that's on uh, Gateway. All right. All right, so this is the update that they have put out to let everybody know the decisions that Gateway Church has done. So this is, it reads, okay, update to Gateway Congregation from the Board of Elders. Thank you for your grace, your prayers and support for all members of our Gateway Church family in recent days. The Gateway Board of Elders is committed to leading with integrity and humility as we navigate this difficult season. As we previously informed you, Gateway Church has appointed the outside law firm, Haynes and Boone, to conduct an independent and comprehensive inquiry. Related to the recent events, as Haynes and Boone begins their work, they have recommended that any Gateway Church elder with a potential conflict of interest, take a temporary leave of absence from the Board of Elders. So take note of the word uh, recommended. But I continue. This includes any elder with a relational conflict and those elders who were on the board from 2005 to 2007. Hayes and Boone made this recommendation consistent with best practices for inquiries of this nature. A leave of absence in no way whatsoever assumes or implies that any elder had any knowledge of the true facts related to this situation. Three of, the, uh, three of our current elders are impacted by the law's firm's recommendation. These three elders did not serve on the Gateway Church staff in 2005. Only on the Board of Elders during the time period of 2005 to 2007. But they are wholly committed to doing what is best for Gateway Church. 
These elders desire to go above and beyond to help ensure that everything possible is done to conduct the inquiry impartially and consistent with best practices. For this reason, these elders have volunteered to take temporary leave of absence from the board. These three elders, Kevin Glove, Stephen Doolin, and Galen Lashaw, are men of integrity who have saved Gateway Church with distinction, and each of these three elders has clearly stated that they had no knowledge of the true facts of this situation. In addition, Haynes and Boone has recommended that Pastor James Morris, James Morris, this is the son of Robert Morris, also take a temporary leave of absence from the Gateway Board of Elders. Pastor James Morris is Gateway's newest elder, and was not an elder between 2005 and 2007. Pastor James Morris is a man of integrity and he has clearly stated that he had no knowledge of the true facts of this situation. However, because Pastor James Morris is related to Robert Morris, Haynes and Boone has recommended that Pastor James also take a temporary leave of absence from the Board of Elders. And Pastor James has volunteered to do so to demonstrate his commitment to a truly independent and unbiased inquiry. We are grateful to these four elders for their leadership, their service on the board, and for their commitment to honoring God and doing what is best for Gateway Church. During this temporary leave of absence, these four elders will continue their important work as valued staff members at Gateway Church. The elders are praying for you and asking God to be with each of you in this season we know that god is still on his throne and he continues to be our firm foundation and we are standing firmly on that foundation now and in the days and weeks to come we know that he loves and cares for every one of you we are praying for you as you continue looking to god as your source of hope and strength so this is uh, the statement that Gateway Church has put out, okay? Haynes and Boone, this is the law firm. Now, if you ask me, I have a problem with this precedence, okay? I don't see any time that you bring in the outsiders to start dictating how the church should conduct its affairs, you open a door wide open. It's very, very dangerous. According to this statement, it actually states, right? For example, James Morris' situation, right? He's, uh, he's the son of Robert Morris. It's not biblically. You cannot be charging or are presuming anything on James Morris simply because that was his father. We can't do that in a church. Not only that, he wasn't even uh, on staff. He had nothing to do with this, okay? So just by him having the last name Robert Morrison, he's also been asked to leave. I have an issue with that, the church to allow that. The law firm, remember these guys, right? These are not Christians. They, they want to conduct something, right? So they're going to operate however they operate, right? They can do that. That's their business. But the church, we, we need to operate things according to the church, so, to me, the way they have led these uh, elders to take leave of absence, I'm not pleased with that. They've opened a door to where I don't see how they're going to close that. So, that's uh, my thing. But what's your take, darling? Um, yeah, I mean, I think I understand why it was done. I understand why they would think that they need to get some sort of outside. So, here's the thing. I think we mentioned this in one of the... Uh, previous videos where it's they are just trying to do everything possible to make themselves look like they are taking every step to make things right okay so they want to look like they've, they've taken every step to make things right and as a result of that they have this outside law firm and now it looks like the elders have their own attorneys which, which is something else right so the elders have their mm -hmm. own attorneys and, you know, it makes sense. They want to be in the clear. And they want to make sure that they don't implicate themselves along the way. Try to take things as cautiously as possible on their part so that they're not culpable for something later on. Because it was such a massive and monumental 
uh, lack of uh, really biblical handling of the situation to begin with. That and that partly because they didn't know much, but it's because of the magnitude of that. Now there's this massive what looks like an overcorrection happening, and that's why you have these outside parties coming in. And I I think in and of itself, it's a good thing. I do think in and of itself, it's a good thing where the elders are stepping away. That part is good. Not necessarily that because it's been discussed and brought about by an outside party, but I think that them stepping away because perhaps they had knowledge of some things or just because they were the ones involved in the process of figuring these things out along the way and the initial statement was not good. Because of all those things, I think it is wise for the elders to kind of just say, hey, you know, we're going to take a leave of absence for a while and just kind of regroup. And what also may be prompting it is if we see the reaction of the congregation. Because if you see how empty that church was, there was a video, I guess, that you did, um, and you talked about that and showed that video. The church was really empty, like half empty. So it's already this thing is impacting them greatly as we speak. So I think that that, that just lets them know the seriousness level mm -hmm. of the whole thing. So they're aware of how serious this whole thing is, and that has caused them to say, okay, look, we need to take further action because at the end of the day, man, you're you're basically in danger of, like, losing your church right now, you know? Yeah, I mean, to, for me, the reason why I'm saying this is because we know, right, like, you have, if some, whatever happened, they, they, they made a mistake not reporting to the authorities, right? This is just a law firm. So these are not like the police. And even when something happens, the police, right? Even if they're investigating abuse in the church, they don't tell like, okay, this person has to step down. This person has to step down. They will just conduct their investigations and then voila, they have their findings. You know what I mean? So for me, they ended up sitting, uh, James recommending him like, okay, he should sit down simply because he's related, things like that. So to me, it, uh, my issue is letting the church to me, I would have preferred if the church had gone, maybe like to the Christian lawyers, so to speak, or to find, like, there are no other Christian people, organizations, who can come in and make sure that, okay, the things that are happening here is up and up. So for me, it's just that issue, like, okay, these people are having so much authority in the church, the authority that they shouldn't be having, exercising. So for me, that's, that's where I'm at. Because I'm saying this thing, because this is what happened with the SBC, right? They opened their door to a uh, guidepost, okay? And these guys ended up, you know, discovering things, things that they were there. And even up to now, the churches that were defamed. And the churches didn't do anything wrong. But at this point, it's too late. Those churches are marked like, oh, don't go to that church. Why? It's quote-unquote, because um, it's... Uh, you know, it's marked, right? Like, okay, that church abuses children. But the church, you know, those churches were actually innocent. They didn't do anything, right? But because these are outsiders, they're going to conduct themselves as outsiders. I don't blame them. But if you are a, they are Christian organization, they are Christian lawyers. So when they're investigating these things, they're going to keep in mind the, the sensitivity of how to operate in a biblical manner. So for me, that's where I'm having trouble with this decision. It looks like they've done this in reaction to the public as a PR. So once a church starts doing things according to the reaction to the PR, you are going to go to a slippery slope. Okay? I'm fine if this church would have been like, okay, you know what? Let's find a way if we have to do something for Cindy, you know, a different way. But yeah, so. but They're in uncharted waters. Can you imagine being... A, okay, well, if you're an if you were an elder at, at Gateway Church with some of the, the stuff that Robert Morris used to teach anyway, like already that's a problem. Like, why are you still there, right? Why are you there? That's we questioned a lot of things about you just off the break. But can you imagine the way life was just going on mm. normally? Everything was, you know, doing what it, it it does Sunday to Sunday. The church is growing. You're doing your thing, and you get hit with this bombshell. Mm. And now you're left to try to figure out how to fix this situation. You know what I'm saying? So I think that there's a sense in where 
we can kind of give these guys a little bit of a break. <laughs> Look, they're like, like, g- give them a little bit of a break because it's like, man, listen, like dudes, dudes are trying to figure this thing out. And I can only I actually feel for them in that sense that they're trying to fix it. And um, at the end of the day, we, we need to look at the scriptures. The scriptures are the, the main thing that are going to guide how this thing should mm-hmm. be done. But there are some things that where it's like, OK, there's not necessarily a precedent for it. And you you only can try to do the wisest decision that you can do. And I don't begrudge them of this decision of having some elders who may have been um, involved in this sitting down for a while. And I said this from the beginning. It wasn't, it wasn't like, okay, I can point to a verse for this, but just out of out of a wisdom issue mm-hmm. and out of an optics issue alone, I really did think that having his son sit down was a good idea. I thought that his son being involved in the church still was not a good thing simply because how could you ask this man to be that impartial to the level of like, yes, you're calling out your dad and all that stuff. And, and, and I'm not saying that he's incapable of it, but it's almost like you're asking for too much for a son to show no partiality, to show a really high level of um, just judgment, wisdom, and discernment. Mm. And for that son to then proceed uh, in the midst of all these things and not at some point, simply because he loves his dad, do or say something or act in a way that's detrimental to the actual uh, well-being of the church itself. Like, I think that that's a massive, massive uh, thing to ask of a son. Yeah, I mean, to be quite honest, it's because that's how their church is structured. Because he is a senior pastor for sure, right? The son is a senior pastor. The other church you have, the son-in-law and the daughter, that's just how this church has structured. So once again, the question would be, was he qualified to have the senior position? Or it is because the dad handed the keys to the son. You see what I'm saying? Because you cannot just be giving the position of an elder simply because the person is your son, okay? So now here we are. It's unfortunate, but... For me, you know, I mean, like, yeah, these people, they, they said they were not there. Fine, they're going to do uh, this investigation. I'm sure they're going to make things public. It just makes things very, very messy for me, what I'm seeing. It's too messy. Uh, yeah. Now, m- messy it is indeed. Messy it is very much so. Um, so I guess we also had the story of Cindy Clemeshire coming through and doing a an extended interview on CBS, CBN rather. And it was um, very informative. And it's like, you kind of got to see her and mm-hmm. know, see who she is a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And, you know, first of all, just shout out to her just for having the bravery to step forward and do this and endure everything she's had to endure through this process. She did say she's had a tremendous amount of support, which is great to hear. Um, but yeah, it was just like, man, here she is, and now she's become this uh, sort of symbol of this uh, whole fight now. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, let's dive in. Let's take a, a listen to what uh, Cindy had to say in her own way. I think I started out just when I was in my 20s sharing with friends or, you know, when it, something might come up, share my story, not even fully grasping what my story was at that time, and really dug into counseling and um, just focused on trying to understand what happened to me because of the connection with Robert and Debbie and the family and the family closeness and friends along with church. And um, after, I was probably about 35 when I really understood the depth and magnitude of what Robert really did, not just to me, but to my family with all the grooming and then, of course, the sexual abuse and the emotional abuse, the mental, I mean, just it's every part of your being is manipulated during these the, that kind of abuse. So at 35, when I was able to actually accept the term sexual molestation and that he abused me because it sounded so mean, and I would tell my counselor, but he wasn't mean to me. And she said, it doesn't have to be mean. And I... Um, heard the term actually on Oprah 
that instead of calling them child molesters, we should call them child seducers. And when I heard all that description, that's when I started being a lot more vocal about my story. And like most believers, you don't want to do anything that's going to tarnish the name of God. And you're not going to, you don't want to tarnish the church. You don't want to hurt other believers. You don't want to, you know, cause another person to not come to Jesus. And so I never wanted it to be a big exposing, you know, I just wanted someone in leadership somewhere to take him out of the pulpit because we did not feel as a family that that's where he should be in leadership when you can't even fill out a document honestly about working in your own church nursery should you really be in the pulpit wow yo mm. yeah yeah man um and i think so she answered in that short clip she answered a bunch of questions right because people have been asking okay why now why is mm. this why has it come out why are you only um talking about this now and you can see that she's been processing this thing for a long time over her life and then coming at a point where it's like okay at 35 years old, you really feel the gravity of it all, and you understand, like, hey, you know, I was somebody who was actually, I was a victim of these these terrible things. And you accept that now and see how those things, you know, affect your own relationships, how you look at things, and all those things. So it took her a while, and people did ask that question a lot. Like, why didn't you come forward earlier? Now, she's going to elaborate more on that in a second, but I thought that was one thing that, that helped answer that question a bit is that, you know, she's been going through her life trying to process these things. She has spoken up before. As I said, she's going to talk about that. But she's been processing this for a while, figuring these things out, therapy, what have you, you know, and coming to this point. So, you know, to say like your lady preacher yesterday that, yo, this <laughs> stuff happened a long time ago. <laughs> Do repent it. We, we, we just good as though things could just be swept under the rug mm. yet somebody was dealing with these things their entire life trying to figure it out is um it's unfair to say such a thing yeah uh, i think the numbers actually do state that they there's a higher number of statistics of people who don't report so the people who who do report these things or who come out they are actually in minority. So you can see that, to me, this just rings that, okay, she was definitely groomed because she felt it was her responsibility to keep the secret, not to, uh, not to say anything until, I guess, like, you know, the older you get, the wiser you become. So it's very un um, unfortunate. And then meanwhile, you're seeing the person who did this to you, like, you know, it's like he's just having a good life, you know? Yeah, I can understand it. Yeah, and I think that also shows, like, well, two things here. One, her, her heart for that that her relationship with christ is 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 intact right that that thing that her relationship with christ is intact and her faith is is a genuine one because i mean for her to say look i don't even want to say these things because I, I don't want these things out because i don't want to hurt the witness of the church mm. and i don't i don't want to uh, pre uh, prevent somebody from coming to christ mm. that's big time man that's huge that 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 was even a thing a burden for her that is huge. That is massive. That's massive. And I, and I just, uh, yeah, just shout out to her for that, that alone. That's that's big time. And they never really, she's talking about it saying that they, she didn't really want much, right? She didn't want much. They just wanted him to be held accountable. Mm. You can't be in that office of, of a pastor. They didn't want, even want him to be in jail so much. They're just like, he just should not be preaching. Yeah. Yeah, he shouldn't have been preaching for sure. I think, yeah, but Robert Morris, <laughs> he had his own plans and here we are. And so anytime he would speak in a church that we were associated with or going to um, in any way, either I would or my parents or my sister would go um, and confront leadership and talk to them and explain to them what happened to our family and to me. And not once has any leadership stood up and said, this isn't biblical. You should not be in leadership. Honestly, you're, you should be gracious to this family and not be that you're not in prison. But no one has taken him out of leadership. 
ever considered it, it sounds like. So as I've told my story along the way, um, I met someone who's now retired pastor. Um, he has been retired for a couple of years. He heard my story. And he is a strong advocate in the Southern Baptist Convention to um, expose clergy that are abusive, especially to children. And he has a friend that, Dee Parsons, the lady that has the Wartburg Watch post or blog, and he encouraged me to reach out to her and share my story because they still work together to expose and, and get this out of church really should be out of everywhere. We shouldn't have it at all in our world. But, you know, anything we can all do to work together. And um, statistics show that people that abuse children typically don't stop. So that's well, always a I... concern as well. I do think that part is true. People don't stop. That's why you always hear uh, multiple stories of these people doing it, right? Because they know people at church are caring and loving and trusting and they ended up taking this part, this advantage. And then that this, um, her family and her sister, they used to go and let the other elders at these other particular churches know what took place. So my question is like, okay, did they believe what they were saying? Because like also, you know, we know you cannot just bring a charge against an elder, especially of that magnitude, right? So... The people they reported these things to, <clears throat> what was their rationale for not acting upon, up, upon it? That's, you know, that's one thing uh, I would definitely wonder. It is true, like, you know, we don't want elders just to accept accusation willy-nilly, right? Because the scripture says as much, like, don't, don't just accept um, accusations against an elder. So who knows how things transpired there, but it must have been so hateful that you're out crying out, you're telling people, but nobody is doing uh, anything about it. It's so unfortunate. Yeah, and that goes to what I was saying earlier, that these this story has been out there for a minute. Mm -hmm. Like, she's been talking about this for a long time, trying her family, even bringing this up to other elders. And that just shows you how many people have dropped the ball on the, the in the mattering of mm -hmm. this in, in this matter and the handling of this matter like there have been a multitude of elders along the way that have dropped the ball now for whatever reasons they did that we don't know but to me i think that the fact that not even one person along the way said you know what let's investigate what she said or mm -hmm. let's let's try to find out more about what she said or let's let's at least bring her in her family in so we can discuss it because lest we end up being here in this church and we're wrapping our arms around people who are mm -hmm. committing committing horrible um acts or they have things in their past mm -hmm. that they have not brought forth and people don't know about mm -hmm. which disqualify them from ministry like there should have been some elders along the way, somebody somewhere, one of those people should have done it. And, and, you know, shame on them for not doing it. Shame on them. And was it because it's Robert Morris, because he's a big name, because he's going to bring people to your church. And, and if you're friends with him, it's going to make you look good. And he puts the stamp on your ministry and your ministry is going to grow and all the opportunities that come from that. Is it because of that that some of these elders didn't do what they were supposed to do? We don't know. I cannot accuse them of that. But, man, it's just like it, it really stinks that that's how this thing was handled. Yeah, I think that's why, to me, I feel like maybe things were dropped along the way because this situation was not reported to the authorities. So for them, they were just looking at, oh, it's your word against Robert Morris. Or like maybe when she said, she'll be like, oh, yeah, we are aware. Robert Morris told us once upon a time, right, he was living an immoral life with a young lady. So something like that, people just, oh, that's just in the past. Keep it moving. Keep it moving, right? So I think it was that type of thing. That's why just like if something is criminal, that's happening in the church, that needs to be reported to the authorities because that is their responsibilities, right? It's to the authorities to investigate, to do that. The church is not going to investigate in that in that manner because that's not what the church is for, right? They will definitely, you know, they'll be they will hand over the person, right? That's why they make sure 
the the people who serve in the church they do background they do all these things right? but we understand if somebody wants to do something they'll find a way let alone if it's a pastor i mean we all trust our pastors right so it's unfortunate but yeah hopefully stories like this will just save as a warning as a way to proceed when we hear these things because we also want to avoid not to just accept accusation or accuse um innocent people so because that can happen as well for sure, mm-hmm. for sure. Um, yes, yeah, see, she said at 35 years old with a teardrop. Yep, that's uh, when she really came to terms with the whole thing. Monorail Beyond the Veil. Greetings, greetings, greetings. greetings. Good to see you. I went to church with Robert Morris at Shady Grove before yeah. he got rich and famous. Wow. I didn't know him then at all, and now I'm glad I didn't. Mm-hmm. Wow, wow. That wow. that must be very, that was a long time ago. Yeah. So uh, you have a different version of him and yes. you have a, a mental <laughs> recording a picture of him recollection of a different version of mm-hmm. of who he was but to think that even at that time he was already doing uh, yeah. what what he was doing that's the time when he was doing this stuff or at least he had just been restored quote unquote restored from doing this stuff so yeah. that is that's crazy that's yeah. crazy that you yeah. actually uh once church with him. Wow. Yeah, him, wow. I know. And, and I'm glad you have the, <laughs> the discernment to say you're glad you never knew him. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Might have sucked you into some false teaching oh, along yeah. the way for yeah. sure. Uh, why? Who says she never stopped fighting? Never stopped. Yeah. Fight for the truth. Such a strong woman. Absolutely. Yeah. Because that, that that's some point. After you've talked to so many people, nobody's doing anything about it. you just be like, you know what? I'm just going to leave it alone. Because, yeah, this story has been all around. She's been speaking. So it's just now that now it's it has blown up. Now everybody knows it. Everybody's reporting. Robert Morris had to step down. So, yeah. It's affect them not just immediately, but throughout the decades. Uh, how much time did you say we have? <laughs> um, and I, I say that with kind of joking, but I'm not joking. There's there's too many things, too many facets of that. Um, I actually told when I was 17. Um, so I was, it was like March of 1987, and my birthday's in January. So you know, I know people have tried to figure out how old I was, like 12 years, and how many months or whatever. But it doesn't really matter. I was 12. I was. I was not a teenager yet, and I told when I was 17, and it did go all the way through my 16th, you know, through the full year of being 16. Um, I don't recall if we saw each other during the year of 1987, those first two and a half months, but when I did tell, um, you know, one of the things I'm sure you read that was he told me the very first time. You can't tell anyone because it will ruin everything. And as a 12-year-old, I had no idea what that meant. And as I, you know, grew and got older, I still didn't really know what it meant. Because when I told, I felt like it ruined everything in my life. It ruined everything in my family's life. All of them, they were very close family friends. And so was the other family that I involved in telling uh, the the lady that was my mother's close friend and her kids were our age. People have been a little confused about that story, but um, my dad was devastated. I, you know, Robert has a sermon that's been circulating the clip about how he, he looked for little girls and there's little, you know, little girls need the love of their father and they need to be hugged and they need certain things. And if they don't get that, they're going to look somewhere else. And then, so he was describing what he looked for and how he, prayed on little girls is what he did in that sermon but I have when I heard that I immediately said that wasn't me my father is still a very loving kind man he was was and still is an incredible dad and leader in our community and I grew up in a wonderful home wonderful grandparents wonderful aunts and uncles and cousins and I I was not lacking in any way I was just a 12-year-old little girl that didn't know any better, that didn't know that someone would do something like this. Very sad. Very sad. And this idea 
of uh, yeah because robert morris says we've already done some videos about that right where he kept um you know outing himself that oh i was specifically looking at young girls who didn't have a good relationship with their father and then the, you know cindy says that was not her case with her situation not only that they were good family friends so this guy decided to do this to his friend's family and just th that was so wrong what uh, what he did is very very infuriating so now the the relationship dynamics obviously this has just changed forever and morris is just out there quietly because so far he hasn't said anything right it's other people who are doing things but he hasn't said anything so we'll see yeah so i mean this is it's, it's very the more and more you hear her talk about this the situation is very sad very sad and like you said i think this now brings in that whole other conversation because if she's saying like look this lady these these girls that he's describing that's not me my dad is there and 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 great Good thing that she has a you know great respect and and uh, admiration for her father here. Um, I love to see that. Um, but for her to say that's not me, that now makes you wonder about what we said earlier. Mm. Is that okay? Then who is that? The ones that had the weak dad, the ones that had a weak relationship with their father, and they were vulnerable, and he and he preyed on them. Mm. If that wasn't her, then because. It sounds like in, in that sermon he said girls, right? He didn't say yes. a girl. Uh, yes. So who are, I mean, this this story could get bigger. It could get bigger. And we're not, not, I'm not saying that to sensationalize this conversation, but this story could get bigger. And what usually happens in these cases, even if you look at the Hollywood situations, right? Mm. What usually happens in these cases is that when one person comes forth, has the courage to come forth, then you see other people coming, coming forward, forward. Mm. and that could very well be the case in this situation yeah and also but robert morris always has an escape hatch right he says that oh i was doing these things before i was a christian when i was out there in the world and he even said like all oh, these things affected me and my wife okay so at what point did morris became a christian so who knows, right? Because we know with when the situation happened with Cindy, Robert Morris was an elder, right? He was a pastor. So we can conclude, okay, so you were, profe you were professing to be a Christian, but you ended up doing these things. So when did the other things with the other girls, according to your testimony or card, he always says, oh, when I was, you know, before I was a Christian. Is it true? Was it before he was a Christian? Or this is just him, just running away it'd be like okay i don't want to say that i was doing these things while i was still a christian but who knows yeah and i mean and by the way this that was the dude was 21 um uh, as a pastor he's 21 as a pastor so if you're saying that you're 21 and <laughs> when was he a non-believer because i mean that's the question yeah. is like okay is he saying that he used to do do this stuff when he was in his teens because oh, if yeah. you're in, if you're in your teens and he was able to see all these things or whatever that also shows like man like you needed some some guidance man you need some mm. therapy along the way because your mind was jacked up if you could think about those things at that point in your teen, like oh, in your teens, to say, "Oh man, I need this." There's this girl over here. Like that's that's a good one right here. She's vulnerable. Like that's terrible. Like yeah. that that kind of thinking is like that's crazy to me. Yeah, you he know? was out there intentionally uh, hunting, right? Uh, hunting women. But the word is, even during the time that quote unquote he was, see, he stepped down, waiting for his restoration. He was still traveling and preaching. So for him, a I guess, later. Would, yeah, you see what I'm saying? So for him, it was like, okay, you know, I'm not necessarily preaching at my church, but you're going other places, you're preaching. So have you stepped down? No, you haven't, right? Kind of like what happened to Tony Evans. He was, like, okay, planning to go and teach at the cruise. Like, ah, I thought this, <laughs> you sat down. So why would you want to go on a cruise and still teach? But that has been canceled. So he's not going to be teaching on the cruise. I just wanted to bring that up. Like, okay. So I think in their mind, when they are sat down, it only it's only referring to their that local church. But they can still operate 
within the same office so long as they're doing it elsewhere not at their primary church so i'm like wait a minute <laughs> please explain this to me craziness craziness if you're sitting down you're you're in repentance <laughs> you're you're that sackcloth and ashes you're chilling <laughs> you're chilling you don't be like okay i just i do that only when i'm at my church that's like absurd you can only imagine the devastation. I mean, my parents devastated. The other, everybody's families kind of fell apart as far as friendships. There was no more get-togethers with any of those people. Um, another family, the couple got divorced, and I felt like I was responsible because I told. And it, it's it's a lot to take on. It's an unbelievably heavy weight. Um, on right. multiple levels, especially for somebody who is, is, was so young going through it and then carrying something like that, you know, right. to being 54 years old and, and having it become very public. And now you're, you're talking about this. But the thing, the thing that strikes me about this story, I mean, a lot of things, obviously, but one big one is that you've talked a lot about God and faith, right. and you very clearly held on to your faith. A lot of people in these situations do not. How have you held on to faith and to God so intensely despite what has happened? I mean, I have to attribute that to my parents and how we were raised. And, I mean, we sat around the table and read the Bible, you know, after dinner. We, um, I mean, my dad taught us about having a personal relationship with Jesus. And even though I have not been actively involved in any one particular church, I have attended church regularly at different times throughout my life, um, but not necessarily been actively mem a member, that sort of thing. But I have never stopped praying. I've never stopped reading my Bible. I mean, it, it truly has been about my relationship with Jesus. And I, like, I said before, I don't know how anybody could get through any of this without that. Yeah, so. yeah. And I mean, what would you say to, to those? There are people out there who have faced, you know, maybe not the same situation you did, but similar situations or abuse, or they feel, you know, that there's a very negative feeling towards the church because of how they were treated in some way. What would you say to those who maybe have turned away from faith as a result of that? They've sort of maybe, you know, blamed the, the church or obviously understandably in some of those situations, the people involved, and they've allowed it to maybe push them from faith. What would you say to them? You know, I, I think that. I can understand 100% why they feel that way. And that's when you just have to go in and be personal with Jesus. Don't, it's not the Lord, it's not Jesus. That is, it's not the Holy Spirit. That is not who, that's not who's doing that. Those are people and those are organizations. And, you know, sadly, we all fall short. Right. I think if we could get back to what Jesus did when he was on earth, 